There we go. Okay, so my name is Marcin Yachimiak. I'm a staff researcher at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the Environmental Genomics and Systems Biology Division. And today I wanted to give you an update on our KG COVID-19 uh, knowledge graph effort for COVID-19 response. And this is my, some artwork by my son actually from a couple months ago. Uh, okay, so as a summary, uh, this is a Python framework for generating knowledge graphs uh, for COVID-19 uh, research efforts. Uh, and it's an open source, free version, reproducible resource. And kind of the use cases we are targeting are in our primary, our interests are machine learning. So a few different tasks, things like link prediction or search via similarity. Uh, also to support complex queries across uh, you know, a disparate collection of data types. <clears throat> and also to link new experiments with reference data. And here on the left is the Gordon et al. interactome between uh, human host proteins and some SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteins. <clears throat> okay, so of course the lack of data is not a problem as we all know. Uh, and there's a kind of major data management challenge here with a few different aspects. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, so of course we have data from, from the previous uh, SARS epidemic and also another related virus called MERS. Those two both appeared in the 21st century. Uh, we also have data on other coronaviruses and of course other viruses, for example, HIV, lots of research there in the last decades that actually has been somewhat relevant uh, to this pandemic. And then for SARS-CoV-2, we already have you know, in the last few months, uh, kind of surprisingly maybe, and of varying quality, uh, but you know, many different data sets on potential drugs, on the host interactions uh, via protein interactions. Of course, lots of sequence data, including the transcriptome, which is very complex. Uh, and then you know, various function annotations. And of course, the epidemiological and clinical data, which may be you know, is in some sort of revolution where we're starting to get somewhat easier access uh, internationally, I think. Uh, and then in terms of publications, you know, we know that number has been rapidly growing. Uh, most of the articles are still preprints. I think we're about uh, 55,000 kind of pieces of text information. I think this includes patents and clinical trials. And there were some statements about doubling you know, every 20 days or so. That, that may not be accurate anymore. But uh, nevertheless, it's you know, a huge amount of literature in a short amount of time, you know, possibly historical record for scientific research in terms of just output. But you know, again, because these are preprints, the quality can be mixed. And uh, in the, for a portion of these articles, we also have the underlying data sets. And that's kind of what we target, try to target in terms of ingests. Uh, and then the last thing you should mention here is that many known bioinformatic resources like the Gene Ontology or Uniprot have some dedicated efforts for COVID-19 data. And we work with those groups to also uh, incorporate that information. And I'll have a slide, specific slide about the protein, the gene models and the protein identifiers and synonyms, which has been a bit of a, a, bit of a challenge as well. <clears throat> so the deep data integration is really kind of, you know, the overarching problem here. Um, and as we know, much of the information is trapped in free text. So text mining has an important component here. But text mining is, isn't really the only aspect here, I think. So we do have these curated database, databases, but the data is not harmonized across them. So meaning they either use uh, different namespaces or you know, different formats, the data structures are different. Uh, they may have APIs, but the APIs will be incompatible. So you're kind of doing one-off work with different uh, data sources there. And you know, the worst case, you might have to use a UI for download, which has you know, issues for versioning uh, and in provenance and just kind of understanding that it's succeeded even, I think. Uh, and so when you drill down to these details, then, you know, this kind of expands into uh, things like you know, identifier and concept normalization and lots of mappings. We actually rely on existing mappings uh, that are available. So part of this is encapsulated in the BioLink model. So this is a high level data model for biological entities spanning kind of a set of entities that you know are pretty relevant for biomedicine. That's where that project started. <laughs> and we use the bio categories to label nodes and the associations between nodes. Um, and another thing that BioLink uh, provides is these preferences for namespaces. So kind of an inequality across different uh, 
identifier classifications, for example. And so for drugs, we follow this inequality. So if we have a KBID that's preferred over these other identifiers. So this gives you kind of a principled way to now harmonize data across different sources. And similarly for, for proteins. Um, okay, so some other organizing principles for, for this effort. So because this, this is a targeted knowledge graph, we try to, yes. Before you go on, can I ask a question about that previous slide? Sure, of course. Oh, I should say, please stop me and ask questions anytime. I think we have some time today. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so the, it, are you saying that the, the extent of the normalization that you are doing is essentially one-to-one -one, uh, mapping between identifiers? Mm, so, so that is on data that is, is uh, already present with identifiers, where okay. it, in, in terms of uh, normalizing terms, so, so far I'll get into that in a little bit, but we do okay. have uh, uh, literature mined data from COVID-19 SciBite, and uh, you know, we, we use the terms and uh, mappings that that came with. And so that would be another aspect here, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, I won't, yeah, I won't spend too much time on that. Well, that's an interesting point of discussion. Maybe we could uh, talk about that after, after the slides. Um, let's see, okay, so I mentioned targeting uh, subsets of data. So this is where you're trying to set a goal for, uh, say, machine learning analysis, where this graph is the supporting data. And so now the idea is to ingest targeted subsets of data sets as applicable to A, populate the graph, but not pollute it with information that might be relevant. And so, of course, that's you know, a difficult decision. And we're actually trying to understand how to create that in some principled way. So I'll have a little bit more on kind of the tools around that. Um, and then, Marcin, of course, we, yes, go ahead. Uh, since you're talking about that, are you looking at all at the authors or mm -hmm. uh, and the issue of, uh, again, uh, deduplicating or, or right. uniting authors' IDs and so on, since a lot of the information comes from yeah. literature. And I, you mentioned provenance somewhere. Yes. So. Uh -huh. Right. So, so the SciBite data, the coordinated SciBite annotations that we took have you know, uh, DOIs. And so in any time that there's, there'll be relationships between you know, a publication and some terms, sometimes ontology terms. And maybe when I get to figure that's kind of an overview of the structure, you, that'll be a little clearer. We actually haven't done uh, the, you know, kind of NLP work ourselves, but we collaborate with a few groups. So another one there is COVID Scholar, and we'll have a, one or two slides on that uh, coming up. So maybe the kind of text mining portion is, uh, is coming up in, in a moment. Uh, let's okay. see. Yeah, and so you know, the authoritative the, the, about the authoritative data. That of course is really just about uh, trusted primary sources, and that is just to say that you know you can find protein interactions, for example, in something like Drug Bank, uh, and, and even though that data may be of decent quality, you know, the actual primary source for protein interactions is something else, right? So this way, you right. kind of mix and match the primary data from your trusted sources. Um, but you do and, keep the provenance. So if somebody wants to somehow filter that. So I was asking that because of I the uh, yeah. network analysis, you may want to say, well, I just want right. these sources or things That's like right. that. That's right. I think the next slide will have a little bit on the okay. structure there, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think maybe this is, uh, this is a little bit in the weeds. Uh, but again, so again, we're biolink model compliance. That's something maybe people could look at here. That's essentially one kind of area where you can align and then become you know, compatible for free with other resources. Uh, okay, so this, this is maybe a little bit more about the structure of the, the data as it's being ingested. So kind of the transform step of, from the primary data source on the way to the knowledge graph. Uh, and so I'll start down here, uh, the KGX format, it, it, this is a tool developed by Deepak Muni and uh, Chris Mungal's group that's used in a few different uh, NCATS projects. Uh, it's, an, it's essentially this lightweight way to represent the nodes and edges with a provenance field. Uh, and sorry, because it's over here. And, uh, and so the provided by column really just explains which data source uh, you know, provided this edge. And then of course the uh, framework itself you know, is a reproducible pipeline. So as you run it, you, it stores you know, all the downloaded pieces, all the intermediate transforms. So if you really needed to track down you know, where this specific edge came from and, and all its components, then you'd be able to look in, into the process of the pipeline. 
Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of available for a deeper dive if necessary, um, but it's not exposed to maybe, you know, your average user. Uh, let's see, so yeah, essentially this is an RDF star data model. Uh, we use a simplify, the simplified TSV for a data exchange. Uh, and, uh, and then we also have loaded this into a blaze graph instance and I'll share that Sparkle endpoint uh, a little bit later. Uh, okay, so one thing I wanted to spend a tiny bit of time on is this idea of the gene and protein identifiers, because I think that's an interesting problem also for uh, NLP and, and, you know, semantic annotations. And so, uh, I don't know if people have noticed, but, you know, early on, at least, this was a bit of a mess uh, in, in that uh, the resources you normally go to for protein information, like Uniprot, had this somewhat strange kind of structure where they have a, had a polyprotein, uh, they had the polyprotein entries for each viral polyprotein and then the cleavage products from those polyproteins modeled as separate proteins. So originally all the functional annotations, the only way to get the functional annotations was through this polyprotein, which essentially you know, compacted or merged annotations from you know, up to 10 or 20 different uh, ORPs. And so, so that was problematic and confusing for people. So we've actually been working with Uniprint and the gene ontology to help resolve this. I think now we're you know much better shape. So this is actually the uh, gene ontology GPI file that we use as one of our sources here. And this is actually just a GitHub screenshot showing how we kind of iterate and uh, showing that the synonym column is being expanded now to include the uh, synonyms detected via NLP and, and the sidebite annotations. And so that, of course, will be a work in progress. I think we don't have all the lexical variants here that could be easily expanded. Uh, but you know, this, since this was kind of human curation in the loop as well, uh, we feel you know this is a pretty good starting point for having synonyms for each viral protein. And so this may be of general use to people. And I, there's a link down here, and I can also share uh, share that uh, in more detail. And we're also working with COVID Scholar. So this is another NLP effort. Uh, going starting from their Matt Scholar work, that was a search engine for uh, material science, and they kind of used the same uh, uh, same word inventing uh, technology to apply to COVID Scholar. So that's COVIDScholar.org. It's pretty has a pretty nice interface, and it's really just a you know fancy literature search using uh, literature embeddings. Uh, okay, so now on to the actual framework uh, as it works. So here is a little flowchart. Uh, so starting on the left, you're starting from your primary data sources. You know, these can come in various formats uh, and live in different ways. Uh, and so we download these. And so all the downloaded files are eventually cached locally. So that's part of the provenance. You're no longer reliant on some, you know, web endpoint of unknown uh, existence. And so everything at some point lives locally. And then you have to have these specific trans transformers for each data type. So that's kind of custom code here that also lives in the repository and so becomes part of the provenance. And each of these uh, downloaded uh, data pieces gets transformed. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and at this point, we store any aliases and synonyms in, as the DBX ref. So we kind of uh, push the actual data integration to the next step. And that's just this massive merge step using also this KGX tool uh, where you're combining the component graphs and you click merge effectively on the identical IDs. Uh, and of course, this could be you know, uh, built out further to do more complicated uh, concept mapping. And so at this point, you've generated you know, uh, a custom knowledge graph. Uh, you specify which of these uh, source inputs uh, gets merged. So it's just a, a list of things. And, and this also means you can generate different combinations of the data, right? And, and that I think for machine learners or other applications you know, is an interesting uh, piece that really hasn't maybe been easily available so far. Uh, okay, so this is an overview of where we are now. This is maybe slightly outdated, but should be roughly current. So at the top are the node counts for the different categories. So the, these are the publications coming in through the uh, Cybed Court 19 annotation and all, we're also working with COVID Scholar on bringing in their uh, concepts and I, we're open to collaborating with anybody on this. So I think maybe this could be some unifying effort potentially. Uh, at the center here are a few different ontologies. So Mondo is a unified disease ontology. I uh, go gene ontology as people should know and then HP is the human phenotype ontology, which actually also includes human anatomy. And so you can see that uh, the literature concepts uh, link to, in the sidebite annotations, link to a you know, fairly good uh, representation of ontological terms 
uh, also the uh, proteins for the, the virus and human host, and in some cases, even some drugs. Uh, let's see, so in a, our current count is, is about this size, so 60 million edges. Uh, okay, this is not a beautiful slide, and it's actually a little bit out of date, but it's just a way to show you, give you a flavor of what's inside uh, the graph. So these are some, some top 10 counts for the edge uh, triples and node types. I should say that the node type, uh, this name thing, this was actually our early effort to bring in the Core 19 data, and since then we've expanded it to specific categories, so the next slide will have a breakdown of that. Um, and uh, the interaction, interacts with is the most popular category on the edge side, and this is both via uh, protein interactions and also you know, drug, drug effects. Uh, and then on the uh, triple side, you know, the, we have the subject uh, property object, and again, interacts with is uh, one of this, the most common one there. So let me just go here. So I think this view should be slightly better. We have to work on the resolution of the image, but this is a Sankey plot sh showing the mapping between our data sources on the left and then the bioline categories that they map to on the right. And so you can see you know, where, for example, the literature data splits into uh, a number of categories here. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, uh, also heavily linked to the ontolo ontological data. So that's kind of one, one interlinked component in the graph. Uh, we all, we're also on the way to doing some analysis here to both understand what are, you know, kind of the underrepresented uh, links here, right? So there's certain categories which you'd be interested in for a specific purpose, say drug repurposing, but that for some reason in your ingest, those edges are just not that common. And so then you kind of go on this expedition to find uh, sources to help populate that. So that, that's an analysis we're, uh, we're doing at the moment. Uh, and let's see. Uh, okay, and I think that's all I wanted to say there. All right, last. Uh, okay, and so I mentioned that one of our applications is uh, link prediction. So this is essentially where you build a classifier uh, using graph as training data. Um, and, and we were actually uh, involved with an effort to develop a new graph learning package called Embiggen. Uh, I, I guess it, its main uh, novelty is that it uses some Rust code for fast graph processing and then also for the uh, embedding optimization. And so we think we can uh, handle much larger graphs than, than previously. It also seems to outperform node to vec to some degree uh, on, on the node to vec evaluation. So that paper will be coming out uh, in the next months. Uh, we also use the Ray framework to uh, tune the hyperparameters. So this is kind of an HPC approach to tuning uh, the parameters that you need to optimize in this full pipeline. So both the ren walks to generate the, uh, the uh, words vectors and then the embeddings, but then also the link classification component, uh, which you know, can evaluate separately. Uh, okay, and then uh, just this expanded a little bit. So I mentioned uh, that we have a collaboration with COVID Scholar, so that's the URL. So they're also doing uh, an NLP analysis of biomedical literature, and we are working with them on mapping the entities that we have in our knowledge graph with the entities they detect. Uh, and so that's, that's been an interesting exercise. It's still on the way. We've made some progress on uh, mapping the viral protein uh, synonyms. So I think that, that will probably be the first thing we can provide. And then the idea is that you know, there's been some work showing that when you concatenate embeddings generated via different methods and data sources, you can gain some predictive power. Uh, and so the idea here is to concatenate the embedding for the nodes from the knowledge graph with the corresponding concept uh, vector, embedding vector from literature, and then apply that to you know, link prediction or say drug they all, Are they all using Embigen or each uses okay. a different? Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, so Embigen is really just for graphs, so that would be this step. Uh, COVID Scholar is using you know, word to vec more, variants more or less. Ah, okay. uh, you can, they have a science paper about their Math Scholar work, I believe from 2019, I could probably share that link. Uh, but, but, but they also have a heavy focus on the UI. So if you go to the site, it's actually a pretty nice interface with like, you know, faceted search and some uh, highlighted terms. Uh, there's also some user interaction there. So at some point that also may be, we, have, we may be able to uh, present kind of the COVID-19 through their interface in, in some aspects uh, via search at least. Are, are you um, looking into any kind of similarity measure for the graph data? Um, I mean, yeah. So in the knowledge graph itself, instead of the text. 
I see. So, so you mean to show which nodes are similar via graph data? Well, right. Uh, yep. For instance, uh, I don't know if you want to show that certain substances uh, under certain uh, criteria are similar mm. uh, based on their or on the topology right. of that's their fair. connections. Yep. Right, so I guess that's, you know, the COVID scholar doesn't use uh, graphs for that, but they, right. uh, you know, I would say that's the prin their principle is to use embedding similarity to find, you know, interesting literature associations. And then for the, on the graph side, yeah, once you generate these embedding vectors, you can, you know, use them with all your vector math, essentially, to find similarity or do subtraction addition, right? And so that, that's something that, you know, we, we haven't built the tooling to uh, for the user facing tooling for that yet, but we do have the embedding vectors and we're, we're actually the, this moment kind of QCing that to make sure that, you know, things will work as expected. So, I, so actually the next slide is really just our first kind of uh, result on the embedding side. So this is a dimensionality reduction view of these uh, node embeddings for GKG COVID. Uh, the, uh, let's see, the, the graph, this was a graph from maybe three or four weeks ago. So that node and edge count will be slightly smaller. I think it's still over 10 million. Um, and each point here is one node from KG COVID uh, uh, colored by its violent category. So I'm not sure if you can see all the details. I, mean, this, I guess this is meant more as a high teasing overview. Uh, and this was generated with the Ambigan node to vec skip gram uh, algorithm. Uh, and I can maybe share more details if people are interested about that. Uh, but I guess I should say that, you know, the, these dimensionality reductions plots are, you know, very beautiful to look at sometimes. Uh, you can't really treat it as a qualitative result per se, but although the kind of the relative, uh, this relative structure still gives you some ideas about clusters in the data, right? And so you can see here that in the center, the orange dots are actually the publications. So these are all the publication identifiers we have. And sprinkled in there, you also see the ontology classes. So that's one link that you could see in the Senki, Senki plot before. So you think that's all consistent. But there's also, you know, there's a green or drug. So there's kind of two areas where you see drugs attached there and maybe also sprinkled throughout, right? So there's a little bit more structure here. Uh, there are, of course, uh, areas which are more or less in, uh, unlinked. So these will be, uh, the, this is a large set of probably human proteins, which, you know, because we've targeted the literature data with COVID data, with COVID literature, it's not really going to have that much information about these other proteins. But they do cluster to, together because they have their own their interactions uh, present. Um, and so maybe I should leave it at that. But as you can see, you know, there's some structure here. Uh, and Biggin is also able to uh, embed the edges of a graph. And I don't have that result uh, for this graph yet, but I think that would also be another interesting aspect to, to look at. Uh, okay, and then I think I'm slowly nearing the end. So I mentioned we have the uh, the data loaded into a triple store. Um, and so uh, this is also using the KGX format as a uh, as an intermediate. And now using Blaze Graph, you can perform Sparkle, Sparkle queries. So this is currently being done to support some uh, national lab COVID response efforts. Um, and mostly around uh, looking for uh, uh, human proteins that interact with viral proteins that look like they're interesting uh, drug targets, either based on you know approved drugs or uh, uh, or aspects like you know their feasibility for solving structure. So this is just some high level overview here of of our uh, you know applications for the national lab efforts. So and this one is around uh, drug target prioritization. So of course for the virus there aren't that many targets. Uh, we you, know, you can kind of memorize them almost. Uh, and the ranking here is, you know, you use uh, information from, like I mentioned, the uh, neighboring viruses, for example, or other data to try to, you know, make some table-based uh, evidence assessment where you can, you know, rank something higher or lower. Um, also based on st available structural information, there's a, about half of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins have available soft protein structures already. So that's pretty rich data that you would be, it's good to link to. Um, and then some, like I can mention some aspects of proteins that make them more or less feasible for crystallization. Uh, just because once you do uh, get a you know, drug candidate, then if you can solve the structure, it's much easier, easier to optimize it, show its mechanism of action, and just you know, kind of convince people that it's going to work. Uh, and the, okay, and then for the host targets, you know, there, there's about twenty thousand human proteins. So I think you know pretty quickly you get to that number, depending on how you look at these neighborhoods. Uh, but th this is work also with uh, PNL, so Pacific Northwest Lab, 
they have a different hypergraph uh, for biomedicine that they're also using. So this is a bit of a collaborative effort. Uh, let's see. So just the links here. So the wiki and the issue tracker can be found on GitHub here in the bit.ly link. Um, so that's where you can just clone this repo and run, run it as it is. Uh, you'll, of course, need you know, an intro to connection and some uh, free disk space. I think the uh, NT file, so the triple triples for KG COVID currently are over 30 gigabytes. This is getting a little bit unwieldy. Uh, and uh, the TSV and RDF representations are available on the wiki. And then the Sparkle endpoint uh, below here. Uh, OK, and then I'll just quickly go through acknowledgments. So most of the, the team is at LBL. Justin Reese is the lead developer. He's also made a number of these slides, so many thanks to him. Uh, Jeep Bakuni is the author of the KGX uh, knowledge graph uh, tool. Uh, Chris Mungle is PI of our group. And then a few other people were involved in helping with uh, Blaze Graph and some of the uh, gene ontology work. And then on the right are, are collaborators from the Biggin uh, graph learning package. So that's Peter Robinson and his group at Jackson Lab. Uh, Luca Capaletti uh, from Milan, and then Tiffany from uh, Colorado. Uh, OK, so I guess I'll t have time for questions and discussion. Thank you, Marcin. Um, I, yeah, I have a question. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. so you have this, uh, this whole setup that generates the data and puts it and integrates it, et cetera. Yeah. Do you have specific use cases that you are exploring against the data? So, so there are a couple of different uh, pieces here. So one is the, the, these national lab efforts, which are working on target lists. So we're using the graph you know, as a reference data source all the way down from things like the protein identifiers and their synonyms. So that, you know, because lots of different labs are involved in that effort and they do different things with different data. So it ends up being, you know, a maybe less interesting, but kind of critical application. Uh, and then in terms of use cases, you know, we have a table of collaborators that we kind of are in discussions with. And so we have a, a document of queries that they like to run. And so I think that is being uh, developed, but, you know, I think we want to uh, build that area out more. So people have, you know, specific queries or applications, I think we can, uh, work with you on that. So these these queries these queries are ex as not stated as queries over the graph, but more high level. What what is it that they want to find out? That's uh, right. That's a good point. Yeah, thank you. Um, right. So so I guess there's a lot of things you could do about the graph structure itself, and I think there we're using more of the embeddings as a proxy. But all the queries that we're working with are things like, you know, give me all the viral proteins for SARS-CoV-2 and their identifiers and their synonyms, or for example, you know, this first or first interactor shell around your viral proteins, right? So they're definitely so, biologically driven at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so you. they're more like problem statements in a way, yes. or sub problems. Is that that'd be really interesting if it could be shared, you know? Because okay. Yeah, I think I can do that. I'll probably have to clean up the document a little bit, uh, but, you know, give me maybe a day or two. And, and yeah, that would be an interesting thing to share. And I guess, you know, I haven't seen this uh, out there, but obviously people have, you know, lots of questions, but a lot of those questions overlap, right? And maybe right. they're overlapping. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, it, that's a really good idea, actually. Yeah. Because also, you know, a lot of people are building the tools, but right. often there are more technical people that don't really know the problem domain. And, yeah. and it's very useful to to have the actual problem and see, you know, because yeah. you build it and, you know, now use it for what, you know? That's right, that's what, right. What, it's the other way around, it should be, right? Yeah, yeah. well, you know, so one, one piece was that, you know, the data was not available one place in, you know, a trusted form, right? right. So that's where all this yeah. started from. And actually, I, I didn't, I should have prefaced the whole presentation by saying that we are already working on knowledge graphs for NCATS translator and the ID, IDG product, project. And so all of these drug databases, we, we already had that in this form. And we had, right. you know, the kind of early tooling for that pipeline. So that's where this came from, right? It originated from existing projects that were already doing knowledge graphs and graph learning. And we just, you know, kind of pivoted a bit to, to target covered response, right? Sure, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But that, that's a great question about the, the queries and kind of different classes of queries, right? So I think there are kind of maybe QC queries about just technical stuff. Then there are some interesting things about the graph structure and how things are interlinked and what paths you can have, right? 
Uh, and right. so I think that that's, uh, so we, we, have, we have a little bit of work going on there. Um, I guess we're always undermanned. But then, you know, because we have these uh, collaborations, both through the national labs and you know, the other, uh, other efforts, both here in the Bay Area and around, uh, we have a document of you know, queries that people are asking, right? And so that actually includes things like proteins, which are less known. They, their functional annotations are fairly poor. Um, so, mm -hmm. so there's some accessory proteins for the virus that you know, we know very little about. And some of those are new relative to SARS-CoV-1. So I think you know, there's some very, very specific questions there. It's almost that for, for COVID Scholar, I think they are actually tracking the user queries. So that could be another source. So that's, you know, a kind of more Google style search term uh, yeah. combination, yeah. right? So I think that would be another interesting piece to add to that. But, you know, COVID Scholar has, I think they update almost daily. So there you can even have an alert and get new information. Uh, we, I think, have a release roughly on a weekly cycle now, which, you know, is not too bad, but it's still not live, right? So right. it is a dynamic uh, knowledge graph, but still not quite live. And so maybe that's another thing to, to consider again. Yeah. So perhaps if you can send these questions to David and you could put a link to it in the notes. Sure. Yes, yeah. I'd be happy to do that I, with the, and include it with the recording basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that'd um, be nice. For yeah. some of these questions, like this would take longer to put together, but for some of these questions, we have kind of an expectation or what would make sense based on, you know, someone's uh, expert knowledge. And that's not going to be complete, right? But it'll be like a little bit of grain of truth or something that, you know, at least made sense to human, right? So I think one, uh, yeah, one, one query that we were using early on was just uh, uh, the viral name or the COVID-19 and spleen, because there had been some early papers, but not many of them showing you know, effects on the spleen. And so A, that was you know, not that easy to find just because it was rare, but you know, now, now there's kind of evidence across multiple lines. That, and so originally that query actually returned spleen effects from different viruses. Uh, which is actually quite interesting. So I think you know it found uh, a similar coronavirus uh, disease, you know, the different virus in ferrets, where they had you know similar kind of cytokine storm effect, right? And so that just you know, ended up being interesting, not necessarily medically relevant, but you know if finding that uh, via NLP search terms you could find these disparate links across literature. I think that article was even you know for maybe ten or fifteen years ago, right? So so it'd be very difficult to find you know just via human search, I think. Right. Yeah. Uh, Marcin, what, yeah. what are your thoughts about uh, where you want to go with this in terms of adding more data sets? Right. Um, so if you look, at, if you look on our GitHub tracker and you know, there's, there's a bunch of t issues there. Most of those are about uh, data ingests. So one thing that I'm working on now are uh, gene expression uh, down and upregulated uh, sets. Uh, so we, one source there is GeneWeaver. They actually have processed data from you know places like Geo, other sources, and that thing they also provide are uh, links, ontological links to uh, for the metadata. So, for example, the tissue or the cell type where the experiment is done, and then also any Go enrichments for that set of genes. So it's, it's just a very convenient ingest for us. So that's one interesting one. I think Campbell is also uh, on, in the works. So that would be, or sorry, uh, Chad Kebby. So that's the chemical ontology, and, and that includes uh, things like structural similarity, right, for, for chemicals. And so there, in theory, you should be able to, so I guess the whole point here is to allow new uh, paths in the graph, right? And so if you, that, and that should be kind of one driver for the design. And like I mentioned, we're trying to think of a principal way to do this. It's, uh, it's kind of early days and maybe, maybe not that easy, but if you, you can imagine where if you now add chemical similar, similarity links, right? To the data, you can now have walk new paths between different drugs, uh, including other information, right? And so I think that's the, those are kind of the ideas that we're trying to leverage and go out there and you know do expeditions on data that would be interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much, Marcin. Appreciate uh, hearing about your work. Hey, Ryan. Bye bye.